Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 220 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. The history of slavery and enslavement in North America often presents slavery as a race-based institution and a Southern problem. But did you know that one of the earliest practices of slavery by English colonists originated in New England? In fact, Massachusetts issued the very first slave code in English America in 1641. So why did New Englanders turn to slavery and become the first English colonists to codify its practice? Margaret Ellen Newell, a professor of history at The Ohio State University and the author of Brethren by Nature, New England Indians, Colonists, and the Origins of American Slavery, joins us to investigate these questions and issues. Now, during her investigation, Margaret reveals information about the practice of Native American slavery in New England and the labor shortage that led to the practice, details about the Pequot War, and how New England legal codes, laws, and customs around slavery developed and worked to support the institution while also leaving openings for enslaved people to contest their status. But first, I'm coming out to Colorado to ski in mid-January, so let's meet up in Denver on Saturday, January 19. The meetup will take place at Prost Brewing at 3.30 p.m. on Saturday, January 19. And I really hope you can make it, because meetups are a lot of fun. They always offer us the chance to meet new people and make new friends, to enjoy great conversations about so many different things and to explore our shared interest in history. Now, for more details about our Denver meetup at Prost Brewing on Saturday, January 19, and to RSVP for the event, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash meetup. Okay, are you ready to explore the origins of New England's practice of slavery? Let's go meet our expert guide. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us is a professor of history at The Ohio State University. She's interested in the colonial and revolutionary eras and in Native American history. She's written numerous articles and book chapters and two books, From Dependency to Independence, Economic Revolution in Colonial New England, and, most recently, Brethren by Nature, New England Indians, Colonists, and the Origins of American Slavery, which won the 2016 James A. Raleigh Prize and the 2016 Peter J. Gomez Memorial Prize. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Margaret Ellen Newell. Thanks, Liz. I'm very excited to be here. So, Margaret, your topic of study is really interesting because there are a lot of different books about the history of New England. In fact, I think the historian Edmund Morgan once quipped that there are as many books about the history of New England as there were New England colonists. And yet, even with all these different books, so few provide a meaningful discussion about the New England practice of Indian slavery. So, Could we begin with you telling us about what drew you to this topic and why you think this particular aspect of New England history has gone understudied? I got interested in the topic when I was working on my first book, which was on the origins of capitalism in New England and its relationship to the American Revolution. So I was looking at the papers of a Boston merchant named John Hull and looking for what he was importing and exporting. And Hull had served as treasurer of the colony of Massachusetts Bay during King Philip's War, this really crucial war between the English colonists and an Indian alliance in southern New England. So Hull's treasury records were mixed in with his personal papers. And I came across a list that indicated Massachusetts Bay had auctioned off dozens of Indians during King Philip's War. And that was the first I had ever encountered Indian slavery and evidence of Indian slavery. So that document was really set me off on the search to find out what the story was. How had that happened? How had Massachusetts become involved in the Indian slave trade? And was it a unique phenomenon to King Philip's War or was it a broader phenomenon? So many historical quests start with just one document. Now, I'm curious about what you found. If we want to understand the Indian slave trade in New England and why the New English colonists started this trade, where do we begin? I think there is evidence of Captivity of Indians, it goes back into the 16th century. Almost every European explorer who visited the New World 
brought back Indians to show off in European courts and sometimes to sell in European slave markets. So there are sporadic kidnappings, but large scale enslavement of Indians to incorporate in colonial households, that I find happening with the first major war that pitted New England colonists against an indigenous group. And that was the Pequot War of 1737, 1738. So My take on Indian slavery is what I call the charter generation. The first generation of enslaved Indians are war captives taken in the Pequot War and in King Philip's War in the 17th century. You know, King Philip's War is a war we talk about quite a bit in early American history, especially when we're talking about early New England. But the Pequot War is just not a war we talk about too often. And yet, it seems like we really have to understand the Pequot War if we want to understand Indian slavery. Because as you note in Brethren by Nature, Indian slavery was a significant ingredient in that war. So would you tell us a bit about the Pequot War and why you think Indian slavery was a significant ingredient? I argue that slavery is both a cause and an effect of colonial warfare. So the Pequot War occurred at a moment when the labor pool for the New England colonists hit a low. So they had brought indentured servants with them, white indentured servants. But the contracts of those servants were expiring in the period between 1635 and 1638. And most of those people were not willing to re-enter into contract labor with their former masters. They wanted to become property owners, proprietors, independent people themselves. So there's a labor crisis in New England in this moment and a general crackdown on all kinds of labor. So I think that is part of the motive. The Pequots were surprised they ended up in a war with the English. They had been in the process of shifting their trade ties from the Dutch to the English. There had been some violent incidents between the two groups, but the colonists had not initiated warfare right in the wake of those incidents. When the English sent an expedition against the Pequots, Pequots actually thought there was a peaceful expedition and the English were there to trade. So for the Pequots, this war came as a surprise. There were larger issues involved, and lots of scholars have written about the Pequot War. The English were interested in taking Pequot territory, Other Indian groups allied with the English against the Pequots, notably the Narragansetts, and were kind of interested in dislodging the Pequots from their position in control of the fur trade from the tribes that lived in upstate New York, northern New England, and these regions. But I would say that there's a lot of reasons why the English and their Indian allies engage in this war against the Pequots. Very quickly, taking captives became a major reason for their involvement. And taking captives really directed military movements and the progress of the war and the widening of the war. In fact, the Indian allies of the English complained about this, that the English were often going after women and children, going after people who had moved away from battlefields and taken refuge in wetlands, which was a very typical thing for indigenous people to do for safety, for protection, a place they could get food. So that the English were actually going after those groups rather than confronting Pequot warriors in the field. This is making me really rethink my own childhood New English education, where I learned about the region as a region of hardworking farm families who migrated first to Massachusetts, all to seek a better life that included the ability to worship freely and build sustainable farms. And I'm searching my brain, and I just can't recall learning about New England as a place that ever used non-family labor systems. So these weren't lessons where we learned about indentured servitude or slavery. And it sounds like family labor was just not enough to run these New England farms. So when you think about the fact that there was a war involved, New Englanders must have really had an acute labor shortage. Well, the Pequots increased the available labor supply by about 33%, by about a third. So I think those were significant numbers for people who wanted and needed household work. Keep in mind that many of the more elite migrants had come from English manors. They had households of 12, 15 servants. It was very typical for them in England. So their expectations were they would have similar sorts of households in the New World. Many of the more powerful political leaders amassed lots of property, you know, often purchased or seized from Native Americans. So they might have three, four, five farms, trading operations, eventually shipping and fishing operations, and they needed laborers to staff all of these enterprises. So all of the political leaders basically got commissions and were considered commissioned officers in the Pequot War or belonged to these honorary military societies in later conflicts. And as such, they got a share of what they literally called the booty from these wars. So captives are also a way to pay soldiers 
that's how these governments paid soldiers was letting them seize Indian goods, Indian property and Indian persons to either use themselves or to sell. So, you know, I was also trained and raised in a tradition of thinking about the New England economy as one powered by people having large families and using their children to labor. But the fact is, you know, children weren't really useful laborers until they became adults. Even for people that were going to rely on the labor of their children, they still wanted other workers. They wanted female workers to help raise the children, to take care of the many, many tasks that went on in a typical colonial household, to feed the families, to do the washing to provide medical care, to process all these raw materials being brought into the house and turn it into bread and clothing. You know, these are the things that women did in colonial households. They wanted men to help care for livestock, to work as sailors, fishermen, to help in times of warfare, to work as soldiers, to work as interpreters, to take messages from town to town and do a broad range of agricultural work. So there was high demand for labor always in colonial societies. They never have enough labor. And Indians were a close and available population to fill that need. This is really interesting because, again, when we think about labor in colonial America, we almost always think of agricultural labor. You know, we think of plantation slavery and the big cash crop plantations in the South and the Caribbean, where, of course, you would need a lot of farm help. But it sounds like even in colonial New England, where the family farm was a staple, there was a need for more help. And I guess I just find this surprising because. With its cold climate and rocky soil, New England just wasn't a place for cash crops and large-scale agricultural farming, so you wouldn't think they would have needed as much help. Right. I mean, they're not growing cotton there, although there's some tobacco growing in Connecticut. But New England turned what they had into a cash crop. One of the things they discovered very early on was that they could supply other slave colonies. So that Virginia and the Caribbean, as those places turned to specializing in tobacco and sugar, and eventually rice and indigo, that they needed food. So supplying enslaved populations with food and white populations, European populations in these other slave colonies became New England's cash crop. Fishing was a cash crop. Trade was a cash crop for them. And they also had to feed and take care of themselves and subsist themselves. So you need labor for all of those things. So New England was involved in slavery on multiple levels. It's a place that used slave labor, and it's a place that made slave labor, plantation, specialization possible in other sites. So that was its main use. When, when English policymakers looked at New England, they thought of it as an unprofitable colony, a place that didn't really produce typical cash crops. But then, you know, policymakers were very aware by the mid to late 1600s that what New England offered was it kept these other slave societies functional, fed, clothed, and profitable to the empire. Now, earlier we were talking about the Pequot War and how that war allowed a lot of different New Englanders to acquire Indian slaves. And something that may surprise you is that the first slave law in English North America was created and enacted by Massachusetts. Margaret, would you tell us about this law and how it defined who could and couldn't be enslaved? Well, the law is interesting for what it leaves out to a certain extent. First, the timing of the law, I think, really ties it to the Pequot War and a desire to define the status of the Pequot captives. So the laws passed or made public in 1641, but this was a legal code that had been in the works since the 1630s. So the law permitted enslavement of people captured in a just war, those who are sold to us by other people, and people condemned to slavery or servitude by the civil government. So the statute basically certainly applied to the Pequot captives and any other Indians captured in warfare but also to any people brought in by third parties and sold as slaves in the colony. So it is going to permit the importation of African slaves. And the third part of that law is important. The idea that the government could condemn people to slavery. So that was a tactic that Massachusetts and other colonies would use quite a bit starting in the middle of the 17th century to enslave Indians outside of warfare. To me, what is also interesting is what's left out. There's no mention of race. So this isn't a law that applied specifically to race. The colonists weren't thinking about race as a category and what made people eligible for slavery or not. It leaves out religion. So other than it does provide that slaves should have access to religion, but becoming a Christian didn't make people free in Massachusetts. So the Puritan colony, the place most associated with grounding the government in religious values, did not offer an out for enslaved people via 
conversion and Christianization. And meanwhile, contemporary slave societies like Barbados and Bermuda and Virginia did, at least initially. Something else that's interesting in that law that you mentioned is just war, that soldiers could take and enslave captives if there was a just war. And that seems like really ambiguous language to me, you know, the type of language that depends on who's doing the defining. So do we know what the New Englanders meant by just war and whether they had a clear definition for it? Just war is an old concept that comes out of early Catholic Church teachings. And there'd been a lot of discussion about just war in the Protestant world in the 16th and 17th century and kind of making rules for war because of all the violent religious wars that were convulsing Europe at the time. But the colonists often turned conflicts with the Indians into just wars. The colonists got to write the histories. So as in the lead up to the Pequot War, they framed it as a just war after the fact, literally went back in and rewrote documents to hype Pequot aggression, looked for incidents that they could blame the Pequots for aggression towards English. So I think that these were often, after the fact, legal arrangements to try to justify what they wanted to do and what they had done. And the same is true with King Philip's War. So the, the announcements of the war, the charging of the troops to kill and take captive the Indians, both accuse the Indians of treason, but also accuse them of violent acts. So the English are always couching these wars against the Indians as defensive wars therefore justifying the enslavement of captives. But the other interesting thing about the statute we were just talking about is that it doesn't mention that slavery is hereditary. It doesn't say the children of slaves will be enslaved. So it leaves a lot of legal gray areas about what slavery is, how many generations it would persist, and so on. So the same was true with some of the early laws in other English colonies. So all of the English colonies are transitioning to slavery, and they're all aware of what the other is doing in terms of practice. New England's the first to create a statute, but other colonies would follow soon after. And they would essentially establish the hereditary nature of slavery by the 1650s, 1660s. And New England never did. So there's never a statute that really makes it clear that slavery is a hereditary status. So New England creates this law, but it remains a kind of vague and undeveloped law of slavery. And that is going to be the basis of the law of slavery in New England for the next 150, 200 years. Would you talk about what this statute meant for the New English slave trade? Aside from war, how did New Englanders go about acquiring Indian slaves? Well, in addition to the Pequot War and King Philip's War, King Philip's War, the English enslaved about 40% of the surviving population in southern New England. So the wars brought in large numbers of slaves at once. But the colonists also kidnapped individual Indians and just converted them into slaves. And particularly by the mid to late 17th century and increasingly in the 18th century, the colonists also condemned Indians to slavery in the courts. So all these things are connected. Warfare was a way to defeat Indian groups and defeat meant incorporation of these groups into English colonial society. And that meant that they were now subjects of the English crown that local governments really controlled what that meant to a certain extent. It meant Indians were now subject to colonial courts. So the Indians found themselves before English juries and judges more and more as the English expanded their control of Southern New England. And so disputes between colonists and indigenous people over who owned land, over colonial livestock and Indian cornfields over Indians you know, taking goods from the English that they viewed that the English owed them based on hospitality, based on resources they were sharing, the English viewed as theft. All these things became criminalized and Indians were given corporal punishment, huge fines. And in order to pay those fines, the colonists established laws that allowed them to sell the Indians convicted of crime to pay these debts and damages. So these were often nonviolent crimes. The Indians could be sold for anywhere for a couple of years or for a lifetime. So this process that I call judicial enslavement became an increasingly important part of the system of bringing Indians into slavery. But I do want to emphasize the kind of informal and ad hoc way that colonists enslaved Indians. They converted free people into slaves by just doing it, by assuming the authority, by treating them as slaves, by creating changes in legal documents. And unless that indigenous person was in a position to challenge their enslavement, they remained slaves. And unless the neighbors intervened to do something or say something about these processes, 
these people would remain enslaved. I think that's very hard for people unfamiliar with the period and, and for me and as a scholar at first to understand because we're so used to slavery being literally black and white, literally involving Africans, literally being, you know, a very extreme system bounded by all sorts of law. Well, in New England, it was not so bounded by law, not so clear. So a lot of times this was people in power who were often the political and legal leaders who were the ones that were converting Indians into slaves. Now, did you happen to find any incidences where neighbors and friends did stick up for a Native American person some New Englander just decided to enslave? I did. I found a number of incidents. There's a case in 1660 where an ancestor of the writer Nathaniel Hawthorne, a man named John Hawthorne, encountered a runaway Indian girl. She was brought into his home and he was a justice of the peace. And he had to decide what to do with this girl. Her name was Maul. And she had been kidnapped from Nantucket. And as Hawthorne interviewed her, he became increasingly sure that her master, a man named John Bishop, was sexually molesting her, that she had indeed been kidnapped. Her parents, there was no contract, no indenture, no clear agreement that had brought her into Bishop's household, which would have been the case if she had been an indentured servant or a year American involved in servitude. And he compared Mal to his daughter. He actually you know, identified with her and identified with her parents, you know, as human beings caught in a terrible situation. He said, I wouldn't want this to happen to a daughter of mine. But when Bishop came, you know, and protested and wanted his slave back, you know, Hawthorne and some neighbors actually fought with Bishop, physically fought him off. But when he consulted with other justices of the peace, they all told him he had to give Mal back to Bishop. That you know, they were very reluctant to intervene in the right of this master. So despite all these things, despite Hawthorne's sense of what was happening to this child, he returned her to Bishop in the end. So there are other stories, too, of American communities, English communities, petitioning, intervening, trying to stop enslavement in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. And one of the interesting things I see over time is by the 1730s, 1740s, the juries start getting more sympathetic to indigenous people, particularly as second and third generation Indian slaves start bringing lawsuits and protesting their slavery. Juries side with them. So that just as slavery was made in a kind of communal way, in a kind of ad hoc way in New England, gets taken apart in a kind of communal and ad hoc way as well. You mentioned juries, and this reminds me, I wanted to ask one more question about that 1641 slave law. You talked about that law and mentioned how it was unclear and ambiguous. In fact, it left out a lot of things about slavery that we would think about today, like race and religion and hereditable rights. Well, it seems like the people of New England really liked that law because it allowed them to do things like just enslave people. So I wonder if the enslaved were also able to use the vagueness of the law to protect and sue for their freedom. So during your research, did you find any cases where enslaved people used that 1641 slave law to their advantage? Yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks for bringing it up. So I mentioned earlier that all of the English colonies are essentially having to create a law of slavery because England didn't have a law of slavery. It's the one imperial power in the Americas that's not relying on Roman law and therefore can't just sort of take that Roman law of slavery and use it to justify what they're doing in terms of enslaving Indians and Africans. The English are relying on common law. There's no common law of slavery. They had to kind of create this out of whole cloth. And this is being done independently of England. These are colonial legislatures doing it. So Virginia, Barbados, eventually the Carolinas and the New England colonies are all sort of together crafting a legal system of slavery. But New England did not adopt some of the changes that some of the other colonial societies did. And notably, slaves retained the right to own property in New England. They retained the right to testify in court, make contracts and bring lawsuits. And those were all very important powers. It meant that they could protest their own enslavement. But I do want to caution your listeners, you know, think of the resources it took to succeed in bringing a protest. You had to maybe have some language skills. You had to be able to speak English. You had to have social capital. In other words, you had to have people that were willing to back you and defend you and support you in the English community. You needed resources because court cases cost money. If you were involved in a case, you had to bear some of the costs. So to bring a suit, to succeed in a suit, really required a lot of unique resources. So 
that option was just not open to the vast majority of enslaved Indians. So I do have evidence of freedom suits, but I do want to emphasize that only a small fraction of Indians were going to be able to take advantage of the courts. Often, the people who were the justice of the peace, the people who were legal officers, they were constables or sheriffs, they were the people who were involved in enslaving Indians. So they were part of the problem. Now, for those Native Americans who did find themselves enslaved, do we have any idea of what their day-to-day life was like in these New English households? We have some idea through these lawsuits and through other court records. Often what shows up in the court records are the people are having problems. So I hear or I see evidence of, you know, abusive situations, sexual abuse for girls, you know, physical abuse for boys and men. But, you know, we also get a sense of what their work lives are from diaries and other accounts that a New England farmer household might have kept. So women are doing the same kind of household work that English servants or that wives and daughters are doing. They are being employed to watch children to make food. So, you know, think about the first generation of Europeans are growing up in households where Indian women might be doing the cooking. So they're introducing this generation of English colonists to Indian cookery, and they're all eating cornmeal mush, they're eating samp, these stews with cornmeal and maybe meat or vegetables in them. They're introducing maple syrup and all sorts of other food ways into the English diet. The reverse is happening too. So the English training these Indian women to take care of livestock, to do dairying, cheese making. So within a couple of decades, these advertisements for the sale of Indian slaves will often mention that they know all of these crafts of housewifery common in English colonial households in terms of needlework and in terms of dairying, in terms of all these other sorts of food production that the English would like to see too. So the influence is going both ways. Men are working alongside other farmers in agricultural work. Kids are taking care of livestock, but men are also being deployed outside of the household in the provincial armies, in the militias, in maritime trades, so for fishing or as sailors, so on. So there's a gender division of labor for the English, and they're kind of imposing that same gender division of labor on indigenous people. And the work they're being asked to do is sometimes different than what they had done in their previous lives. Indigenous men were not typically agricultural workers, and now they're having to engage in agriculture. So They're having to live in households in really tight quarters with the English, right? So everybody's sleeping together. Everybody's eating together. These people are not living in separate quarters. They're living in the homes and households with their English masters. So think about all the communication. People are growing up hearing Indian language and learning Indian language and vice versa. The Indians are being acculturated into English language. Young children, Indian children are being catechized and their attempts made to convert them and so on. So there's an incredible cultural intermingling going on all through the colonial period. Yeah, it does sound like there was a lot of cultural exchange or intermingling going on. Lots of new food, new languages, new ways of doing things. And I wonder, was this process smooth or was it jarring? Because I imagine it must have been jarring at times for Native Americans and also for the people who enslaved them. Did you find any examples in the archives of where some of this cultural exchange and intermingling was just so jarring that it happened to cause a lot of resistance between either party in this relationship? There's not so much examples of the English reacting against this acculturation. In a funny way, they sort of take it in memoirs and so on. They remember it quite fondly. They really start taking the presence of Indians for granted very quickly on and show a kind of comfort level with Indians from southern New England, at least. For indigenous people, there are a couple of narratives in which Indians discuss this experience of growing up in a white household and then, you know, show some of the, how complicated it was, especially for children who were introduced as servants or slaves. So there was a young man from the Kwasan family in Cape Cod and Mashpee. His parents fell into debt. So they essentially contracted him to a family, to English colonial family to pay the debt, or they were going to be brought to court, possibly enslaved or made into servants themselves. So parents often tried to stay free themselves, but would give up their children as a way of trying to keep the family going. So this boy, he's separated from his family. He doesn't really get to see his family very much after he's placed in this English household. He forgets how to speak his indigenous language. You know, he has affectionate feelings towards the family at times because he's being raised in this household and they're catechizing him and raising him alongside their own children. So he goes to church with them. He feels 
part of the family and yet not part of the family. He sometimes opens up their warehouse and lets other Indians steal from it. He both is involved in this culture and is part of it and is being raised in it, and yet he is resisting it at the same time. So I think these sorts of stories are very hard to get at in the kinds of records that are available, as they are for all enslaved people in this period. But we get inklings of the tension. A lot of parents of children who are in servitude or slavery make efforts to stay in touch with their children, to visit them, to make sure they get to visit relatives and to participate in ceremonial life and in religious life, to attend funerals. And they're sometimes individuals, adult individuals also make a titanic effort to stay in touch with their former communities. But over time, those communities are changing, are becoming much smaller, much more diminished, and they're under a lot of surveillance by the English so that the ability to run away, the ability to kind of return, the communities they had been taken from are not maybe in the same place. They don't look the same. They've been altered as well. So we've had opportunities in other episodes to speak with Wendy Warren and Jared Hardesty about the New English practice of African slavery. And both historians talked about how, especially for African enslaved people who lived in the New English countryside, they lived really isolated and lonely lives. Whereas those who happened to live in a place like Boston had much more of a community of people that they could interact with. And I wonder, did enslaved Native Americans have similar experiences where they lived isolated and lonely lives out in the countryside, but had more of a community to interact with in populated areas like Boston? No, I think there's a lot of similarities. So in fact, the enslaved indigenous people in urban areas are very much hanging out with both free and enslaved Africans, English and other immigrants servants and free people. So, you know, I think their social life becomes about class. These folks are all living in attics and in basements, sleeping on floors here and there, but they do have some free time, some mobility, and they do get together in informal taverns or meet on the street or find ways to connect and socialize with one another. So there's certainly plenty of evidence of that. I think in more rural areas, it could be isolating. In the 17th century, there's still really large indigenous communities in New England at least in the early part of the 17th century. So Indians dominate numerically. There are 140,000 Indians in southern New England. But by 1670, there's only about 15,000. So that their opportunities to connect with free Indians and these large free Indian communities are always there. But those opportunities shrink over time as the size of the free Indian population shrinks. And as those folks are moved on to reservations and you know, under a fair amount of surveillance by the English regimes. So I often do think about how are indigenous people experiencing this? And is it isolating? Is it alienating? I think it is to a degree. But I think their experience is still different from that of Africans, because at some level, they're still in an environment, in a location, a place that they're familiar with, separated from kin, which is devastating, but they might still have opportunities to connect with kin if they're lucky. So this slightly different situation for these indigenous slaves. Earlier in our conversation, Margaret noted how Native American slavery came before African slavery in New England. And right after we take a quick moment to talk about our episode sponsor, I'd like for us to explore the degree to which the two practices of slavery may have informed each other. This episode is brought to you by the Omohundro Institute, proud publishers of award-winning books since 1943. As we've been exploring in our conversation with Margaret, even though New England is one of the most studied areas in early American history, The region's practice of Indian slavery has not been the subject of too many books or articles, even though it was this enduring and widespread practice. So Margaret's research demonstrates something to us that we already know, which is there's always something new for us to discover about early American history. And reading broadly and deeply is the key to how we make these discoveries. Over the last 75 years, the Omohundro Institute has published over 200 books, many of which are now classics in the field of early American history. You should really check out their list of great titles, which you can do by visiting benfranklinsworld.com slash oibooks. And when you're browsing benfranklinsworld.com slash oibooks and you find the fascinating titles you want to read and add to your library, use your special listener-only promo code 01DAH40 and you'll receive 40% off any of these titles. That's promo code 01DAH40. Don't worry, I put the promo code in details for this sale in the show notes, and in your Ben Franklin's World app. Margaret, you mentioned that Native American slavery came before African slavery. Did the practice of Native American slavery inform the New English practice of African slavery in any way? 
Oh, I think very much so. The Indians are the dominant labor form. They dominate slave population up through the early 18th century. You know, African slaves are difficult to acquire for English colonists in the Americas. And the supplies are not great. They're extremely expensive. The supply is not predictable until England gets into the slave trade. And even then, the mainland English colonies are always an afterthought, right? So most of the enslaved people are being bought and sold in the Caribbean. But I see a lot of New England farmers who live in coastal areas, you know, jumping on their boats and heading to the Caribbean and buying slaves for themselves and for their neighbors in small groups. Larger New England port cities like Boston, Newport become hubs of the importation of slaves increasingly by the 18th century. So the supply of Africans increases. But Indians still remain an important labor force. Indian slaves are much cheaper than African slaves. They're available. I think there's a kind of cultural preference for Indians to a certain extent because they're more familiar. And by the late 17th, early 18th century, they're more acculturated. Although the New Englanders for a period, they import Indians from the Carolinas and from Spanish Florida that are raided or captured by other indigenous people in the Yamasee War by the English, as the English are making incursions into these regions. So there's a sort of a brisk slave trade and Indians from other regions that are also being brought into New England. There's people from Suriname, from other portions of South and Central America end up in New England as well. So you've got this sort of diverse population of slaves, but the law of slavery remains what it was when it was framed around Indians. So still the inheritability of slavery is unclear. You know, still enslaved people retain the right to testify in court, to bring court cases, to own property, to make contracts. By 1700, you know, no enslaved populations have in other regions, not even in the middle colonies. And this becomes the framework for these Africans and indigenous people from other regions, that they will keep these rights. Now, at the same time, New England is being influenced by what's happening in other regions. And as more Africans enter the slave population, particularly the purchasers of those African slaves are pushing, pushing, pushing the colonial assemblies to bring the law of slavery more in line with the way it existed in Virginia or Barbados or South Carolina. So around the time of King Philip's War, which is when this other big wave of indigenous slaves enter the slave population, the New England colonies start adding elements of what are known as the slave codes, codes that applied only to people of color. These are explicitly racialized laws, so that now the law of slavery is becoming racialized. And they are things like people of color can't assemble, you know, restrictions on bearing arms off and on, special courts for people of color who are accused of breaking the law, you know, courts without juries sometimes. Two other laws that end up being extremely controversial in New England and have different outcomes in the end. One of them is the law against intermarriage, creating a kind of racial color line regarding marriage. And in Massachusetts, when that law is debated, a sizable number of the legislators don't want Indians included in the law. So they actually want to pull out Indians. So have the law apply for Africans, but not for Indians. And in that case, they succeed. So Indians are not included in the anti-miscegenation laws and the you know, laws against racial intermarriage between Europeans and people of color. But another law that observers also see as really crucial is in moving the whole system towards a more Caribbean or Southern form of slavery, bringing Indian slavery closer to African slavery, were laws that changed the tax status of slaves. So Virginia had done this pretty early on, where indentured servants were taxed as people. So when you were taxed as a homeowner, you paid a tax on every person living in your household effectively. And you paid a slightly higher tax for people who were of laboring age for yourself, your adult kids, and any indentured servants or other laborers who are living in your household. And that's basically how Indian slaves and slaves of all kinds had also been taxed in New England. In 1716, Massachusetts has this big debate over whether to start taxing Indians and Africans as things, as livestock instead of people. And everybody you know, involved in this debate knows exactly what's at stake in it. You know, it's a dehumanizing thing to do. It's making the system more like the slave system in other places. So Samuel Sewell, who had written a mildly anti-slavery tract in 1700, but who also very much took Indian slavery for granted, but also did not want the racial intermarriage bans to apply to Indians. He really fought against this law. 
And I think his ambivalence was shared by many of his contemporaries. So I think in New England, because Indians were the charter generation of the enslaved, because Indians, their humanity was not in question for the English colonists, that creating this and adopting this extremely dehumanizing slave code system of slavery, they hesitated to do it. There were some people who wanted that very much. They used terms like, let's bring our system, you know, into the same situation, that it be slavery after the style of Virginia or after the style of Barbados. And others resisted because of the implications of such changes for Native Americans, because they do view Native Americans as human, as their brethren by nature, as essentially like them, as capable, creative, powerful, essential in some cases to their religious visions of Christ's second coming and so on. And so there's a kind of resistance to shift the law of slavery into these more formal ways. This is actually the basis for a lot of the freedom suits that come up in the 18th century are kind of the efforts to make slavery inheritable and people kind of fighting back against that inheritability. So, for example, in 1739, a man named Caesar walked into a courtroom and he had run away from his master, who was a blacksmith. And Caesar made a claim to freedom. He said that his mother had been a child captive during King Philip's War, but she was supposed to be freed after a set term. And her master, the person who had bought her, had died. His widow had remarried a ship captain named Thomas Young in the Long Island area and had basically taken this female Indian slave Betty with him to Long Island. There she had had a relationship with another enslaved person in the Young household and had a baby, Caesar. So Caesar's claim was that his mother had been illegally enslaved, that she had been converted from a term servant into a slave illegally so that he was not a slave. He had been born from a free person. Therefore, he was a free person and could not be bought and sold. And a jury agreed with him. The individual who presided over the initial case, Joshua Hempstead, Joshua Hempstead was a slave owner. He owned an African slave. He took the boat down to Barbados and bought slaves every once in a while and brought them back up to sell to his neighbors. He, as a justice of the peace, sentenced Indians to servitude and slavery. He auctioned off Indians at public auction, which is what courts would do after they passed judgment. They would hold public auctions of Indians. That's what people did after they brought captives back from wars. They held public auctions and sold them off. So Hampstead had presided over such auctions, and yet he allowed Caesar's case to proceed, and Caesar won his case in the lower courts. When these cases went to appeal, eventually, if the disgruntled masters wanted to take the cases all the way to the top, they ended up in the lap of the colonial legislatures because they functioned like a Supreme Court. And it's very tough to get at what went on in the background of these debates because nobody kept notes. There's no publication of roll call votes or no backstory the way we would get today about what's going on in the legislatures. But few people sometimes kept journals. And I can tell from looking at journals in Connecticut that anytime these freedom suits went to the legislatures, the legislatures were very reluctant to rule because they knew If they took a position on inheritability one way or the other, and they were under pressure to do so by both sides, that would change the law permanently. So they preferred to keep it vague and to sort of let things go and put the burden in many ways on the enslaved person to challenge their slavery rather than making a blanket change to the law. But on the other hand, this really frustrated slave owners who wanted to get rid of this ambiguity and wanted their ownership made clear. So it was an outcome that wasn't satisfying to either side it did still allow some small opening for people to bring freedom suits. Now, we always have to keep in mind that Native Americans were not passive bystanders and that they would have participated in this new English system of slavery. We've talked some about how Native Americans resisted the system of slavery. So, Margaret, do you happen to have any examples or cases that you can tell us about, about the ways Native Americans may have facilitated the new English practice of slavery? Well, I think they both facilitated and protested at different stages. So in in terms of facilitation, at least in the context of the colonial wars, usually there were some Indians involved on the English side. So in fact, the Narragansetts and group that formed out of a breakaway Pequot wing called the Mohegans joined with the English in fighting against the Pequots. And both the Narragansetts and the Pequots took captives as well. They turned over some captives to the English. So they participated in putting people into captivity. But I will say that 
right in the context of the Pequot War, the Narragansetts were very surprised at what happened to the English captives in Boston. They were surprised at their enslavement and protested about it. You know, from their point of view, they tried to articulate a definition of captivity that was very different from their servitude. So the Narragansett leaders actually complained about this via Roger Williams, who was sort of the interpreter diplomat between the Narragansetts and Massachusetts and Plymouth authorities. And Williams really relayed the Indians' dismay about what was happening to the captives they had turned over to the English or the captives the English had taken directly and said that their view is that captives should have houses and should be allowed to live in the community. So for the Narragansetts and other indigenous groups who took captives, generally what they were looking for was population. What they were looking for were people to be maybe tributaries that might have to turn over some you know, annual gifts, recognize the authority of the sachems, the Indian leaders. They might even have to provide communal labor of various kinds. But they were free, essentially, within these boundaries to live their own lives, to have their own families. And and in general, these demands and claims were pretty light. Many Indians were involved in tributary relationships. So in other words, it just meant acknowledging the authority of political authority of another sachem. But that authority rested pretty lightly on the people who lived within that sachem's rule. So that was the Indian notion of captivity, more or less. So the English are taking a different direction. The Indians are very aware of this. The English were also talking about slavery and inserting language about slavery into all of their contracts and treaties and dealings with the Indians from the Pequot War onward, threatening the Indians with slavery if they got involved in any conflicts with the English, threatening them with slavery if they trespassed or got into any kind of interpersonal conflict with an English person. The Colonists inserted fugitive slave laws into the treaty that ended the Pequot War and into other sorts of treaties and agreements with the Indians moving forward to try to keep them from sheltering runaways. And sheltering runaways was punishable by enslavement of oneself. So the English are really trying to define captivity in a different way than the Indians were thinking about it. So I'd say the Indians resisted enslavement in other ways. At every stage, they protested what was going on and expressed concern about what was going on. So Indian leaders you know, frequently bailed out their followers to prevent them from being caught up in the court system. But at some point, their assets and their ability to do so really became limited over time. So this was a way of kind of taking Indian land was sort of to force leaders to sell land in order to post bail or to pay fees and fines for tribes people to keep them from being made into servants or slaves. So it's all part of this or transfer of territory from Indians to Europeans. But Indians really did complain about this quite a bit, both to local leaders and to the English. So the, the Indian complaints actually really started engaging the English empire and really brought the English empire to you know, criticize and question this whole policy of enslavement. So the English colonists in America still continue to enslave Indians in warfare after King Philip's War. In fact, their enslavement and slaving activities created other wars in northern New England and in Canada that raged off and on for another 70 years. Four major conflicts that created a lot of destruction, a lot of death for the English colonists in this region that really were provoked by aggressive slaving in and right after King Philip's War. And the English were sort of feeling like this policy of enslavement was costing them money was creating warfare, was impeding their ability to form alliances with Indians in the Northeast and Canada. And then they were hearing the petitions of indigenous groups who were English subjects. They weren't just subjects of Massachusetts. They were subjects of the English crown. So this idea of subjecthood, of the idea of the Indians, you know, being subjects and people who belong to the empire and had a place in the empire that was equal to that of the colonists in English eyes, that became leverage for Indians protesting enslavement. And they succeeded in really getting the English to tell the colonists to cut it out, to stop doing this in warfare. And the English government forced colonists to turn over captives, captured in wars in the Northeast in the 1720s and 1730s. So they the big return of captives. So those are ways I think that Indians protested slavery. And I think also just in everyday acts of running away, of trying to bring suits, trying to challenge what was going on locally and the casual conversion of people into servitude. Those are all ways of bringing attention to the problem. So I'd say overall, New England's a bit of a contrast with other regions that involved in slavery, say in the Southeast or parts of the American Southwest. 
where Indians were doing a lot of the capturing and were selling Indians to Europeans in ways that kind of resembled what was going on in Africa with the African slave trade. Whereas I think in New England, it's really colonists capturing Indians and colonists converting Indians into slaves. They weren't being brought to them by third parties so much. They were really doing the capturing themselves. These were state actions in New England. The state was overseeing a lot of these processes. The state was running slave pens. The state was running auctions. You know, the state's operating the courts. It's making the war policy and the captivity policy. So I think the involvement of the local governments and local officials is an important variable in the New England situation that made indigenous roles in enslavement there are not as big a factor as we might see in other regions. What about the end of Native American slavery? On July 8, 1783, the Supreme Court of Massachusetts acknowledged at least that the practice of African slavery was unconstitutional. Did the end of Indian slavery come with this ruling or did it end at some other time and in some other way? Well, I think the two are very bound up for a number of reasons. Liz, I'll challenge you on whether that Supreme Court decision really ended slavery, because like the vague statute of 1641, that was a judicial decision. It wasn't a statute. It didn't really, in the end, clarify the position of all enslaved people in Massachusetts or necessarily apply to people in other colonies. So what happened was some people walked away from slavery after that court decision, and other people followed and brought freedom suits. But people who didn't hear about the decision, people who weren't aware of it, people in other colonies that it didn't apply to, and even folks in you know, some enslaved people in Massachusetts weren't able to take advantage of what it promised. So one of the very interesting things about New England and the North and its involvement in slavery is that states were very slow to actually pass statutes abolishing slavery. In Connecticut, it didn't happen until 1840. So Massachusetts is just super slow about creating statutory remedies for the situation, just as they had been slow to elaborate the statute of slavery. So they really still put the onus on individuals to find their own way to freedom for decades after that law. So that's one point. The fate of Indians and Africans was very bound up by this point. They weren't really considered to be distinct forms of slavery. This was New England slavery. One of the other processes that I see happening and those slave codes I mentioned earlier are a reflection of that, was a racialization of slavery. So remember that initial law in Massachusetts in 1641 didn't mention race. Race wasn't a qualification for slavery, wasn't associated with slavery. But because of practice, because in practice, after 1660, there weren't very many European slaves in New England, and most of the enslaved population was indigenous, people of color, and the new slaves coming in in the 18th century after 1720 were Africans. You know, people had begun to associate slavery with race, with being a person of color. Then those slave codes, special laws that just applied to people of color, only reinforced that sense. So there's a process of racialization of slavery going on where it's increasingly becoming something associated with indigenous people and African people and biracial people. The other thing that was going on was some of the English colonies now had made Indian slavery actually illegal. So Rhode Island passed a law after King Philip's War abolishing Indian slavery. Massachusetts and Connecticut didn't, but particularly in Connecticut, there was sort of a vague sense that Indian slavery was on somewhat shaky grounds. So this didn't change people's practice, right? So there's still people converting Indians into slaves. The courts are still sentencing Indians to servitude because that was still legal, right? Remember the statute did allow you to sentence people to slavery and servitude. So there's a gap between practice and what these statutes are saying. But one thing that that statute did was encourage would-be masters who wanted to enslave a person of color to categorize that person as African. So there's a push to identify Indian slaves and servants as biracial, as mulatto, as musti. Like these are terms imported from Spanish practice. They have no legal standing in New England. Right? There's no English law of castas like there is in Spanish America, where that the castas, these ranks, these racial categories are all laid out for everybody and they're part of the law of the land. That's not the case, but they're using this language from other slave systems. So they start using terms like musti, which means part black, part Indian, mulatto, part white, part African. Those people are okay to enslave so that there's an 
effort to almost erase the indigenous identity of Indians who are either targets of slavery or already being held in servitude and slavery. So that all of these other pushes to maybe protect Indians and to prevent them from being enslaved or to you know, prevent the whole slave system from becoming more abusive, to sort of derail those efforts by Africanizing the Indian population in name. And I'd also say that there is a fair amount of racial intermixing between Africans and Indians in the 18th century. I mentioned earlier that Indian men are being deployed in whaling, in sailing, in maritime affairs, in war. These are activities that take people away from home for large amounts of time, and they're also high risk, high mortality activities. Indian men are being killed in warfare as well during these major Indian wars, and they're being executed in higher numbers rather than enslaved. So Indian men are enslaved, but they're often just killed outright, right before some of these auctions and giveaways of slaves if they are thought to be a threat or they're thought to be someone who might have been involved in killing English people in warfare. All of these things meant that the indigenous population is becoming very skewed towards female. And right? so the ratio of men to women is very out of whack by the late 17th century. And this continues even more so in the 18th century. So when African slaves are brought in in greater numbers, it's more of a male population. So people form relationships with African slaves and African free people are forming relationships with free and enslaved indigenous women. So the population of both the free and enslaved communities of indigenous people is becoming more multiracial. And this makes people very vulnerable to enslavement. So, for example, Caesar, the individual I mentioned earlier, who marched into a New London court and demanded his freedom, the court record for his case, you know, Joshua Hempstead's account of this, it lists him as first he writes slave, then he crosses that out and writes servant. Then, you know, he says Caesar, a musti, crossed out. Mulatto, crossed out, Indian, you know. So, like, what is Caesar? Is he an Indian or is he, you know, an African? Which of these is most important? Is he a servant or a slave? You know, what is this guy's status? It's not even clear, you know, in this document in which Hempstead writes up, describe the case. And I see this sort of stuff over and over again, these documents where people who are Indians are listed as mulatto or they're listed as three or four things. You know, each of these categories were important. They had legal meaning. They could be the difference between slavery and freedom for the people involved. There was a woman in Rhode Island named Sarah Chakwam, and she was a servant, but her master sold her as a slave to a man named Edward Robinson in Connecticut, in New London. So New London was a big, you know, sort of slave center of bringing slaves in and out. So she was taken from Rhode Island, where Indian slavery was theoretically illegal, and brought to Connecticut, where there was no legal ban. And in the bill of sale, she was listed as a mulatto. So Sarah Chakwam actually sued to establish her Indian identity and her connection with a free community in Narragansett as a way of trying to fight this enslavement. So someone was trying to turn her into a slave by changing her ethnic identity and almost succeeded. So she was able to fight back against this. But I think there are many, many people who don't appear in the kind of records I look at who are not able to fight against this racial transformation that they ended up facing. So this process of racialization is blending and integrating the Indian and African slave communities in lots of different ways. So this process shows the kind of double-edged sword that the arrival of Africans in large numbers represented. It really did push the slave system in New England in directions that were bad for indigenous people, put their risk of enslavement higher, reduced their rights as servants and slaves, made them vulnerable to kind of an ethnic erasure. For Africans, the New England system remained a system that offered more rights and opportunities than they might have encountered in other slave systems. It was still repressive, still masters that were going to try to keep their children, still subject to physical abuse and everything that came along with the horrors of slavery, but with certain legal rights that they might not have had in other regions. So the earliest abolitionist societies in New England mentioned both African and Indian slavery as the wrongs they want to right, so that this is true before the revolution and after the revolution, that Indian slavery was very much on people's minds as part of the larger problem of slavery, that they were joint issues that needed to be tackled. Now, before we jump into the time warp, would you tell us why you think it's important for us to consider the practice of Indian slavery in early New England? In what ways do you think better understanding this practice can help us better understand early American history? I think it's part of this bigger story that a lot of historians are telling about slavery in the North and how prevalent slavery was 
you asked me earlier in the interview about why haven't we heard about this history more? And I think it has to do with the fact that the Civil War gave the North a pass and the North took the pass. You know, so much loss of life in the Union Army, the bloody shirt, the massive amounts of casualties in many ways ended one history of slavery and started another history of slavery, a history of slavery completely focused on the idea that slavery was a Southern institution, only involved Africans based on large plantations in the antebellum period, kind of wiped away the longer history of slavery in the North in the colonial and in the early national periods. And that's a history that people were very aware of in the 18th and 19th century. So the earliest histories of New England and of Indian warfare and so on always mentioned slavery. Novels in the 19th century often had Indian slaves as major characters. People were aware of that slavery. Civil War represented a kind of sea change in memory and understanding, and in really the Norse willingness to grapple with its own past. So I think this book is part of that larger reconsideration of the role of slavery in the North and the importance of slavery in the North. And, you know, for me, New England is the place that Historians for generations used as a stand-in for all of America. They would generalize from New England to explain the entire colonial and early national story. You know, New England's associated with being the birthplace of democracy, of America's religiosity, of the first legal codes, of their important role in the American Revolution, and so on. So it's always been a place that generated a lot of historical writing, and it was emblematic of certain values and certain patterns that are part of the story of American history and also the source of a lot of American exceptionalism and ideas about American exceptionalism. So to show the importance of slavery in this society, the ways in which, you know, all of these other elements that we value are interested in New England history, its political system, its government, the role of the family, etc., were themselves actually part of the system of slavery, the economy, also very much enmeshed in slavery in various ways. You know, if it's happening in New England, that is therefore telling you this is an American story. The role of slavery in all of these English societies and all of these colonial societies, there's no exceptions to that role. So I think that's a contribution. And the other thing is to talk about the importance of how slavery affected the indigenous community and vice versa. I think, again, especially in the American imagination, the U.S. imagination, the Civil War and the role of antebellum slavery wiped out or sort of overwhelmed our understanding or our recognition of the importance of indigenous slavery in the earlier period, the association of slavery with Africans and African-Americans, with plantations, with cotton production. You know, I'd say this new interest in the in slavery and capitalism and that debate is in some ways reinforcing that notion that the antebellum slavery is the important thing to look at. I love that discussion. I love that debate. But, you know, I think it's, it's actually reinforcing this notion about plantation slavery being the definition of slavery. More than half of all enslaved people in North America through the Civil War lived in households, not plantations. We know a lot more about plantations. We don't know as much about household slavery because people didn't keep good records. That's a story that's harder to get at. I'm also trying to capture that story, the story of the household slaves. I'm trying to capture the fact that Indians were the charter generation of slavery in America. They were the majority of enslaved people in America before 1720. You know, that's for more than a century. And I would include Virginia in that statement. They're the majority of enslaved people in Virginia probably through until about 1690, 1700. So I think, you know, we're still getting at the extent and role of Indian slavery in the English colonies, just as other scholars are also now establishing how pervasive the Indian enslavement was in South and Central America and Mexico, in the American Southwest, in the Upper Plains, in the Comanche Empire, etc. We're getting a better sense of these incredible patterns that really involved all of North America and the Caribbean and the indigenous peoples in these places and enmeshed them in a regional slave trade, smaller than the African slave trade, but still incredibly significant for the people that participated in it. And finally, I'd say this is a, also explains what happened to indigenous people. It's a story that you know, enslavement is the ultimate form of dispossession. Enslavement facilitated the dispossession of Indians from their land. It facilitated the wealth transfer from Indians to Europeans, your Americans. That's part of the story of American colonization and U.S. expansion in the 19th century. So slavery is the extreme of that process of dispossession. Let's move into the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question 
about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if New Englanders hadn't turned to Indian slavery as a method to fulfill their labor needs? How would the lack of Indian slavery have impacted the practice of African slavery in North America? I think it's possible that New England would have moved harder and faster to get involved in African slavery. The exportation of Indians was part of the regional economy and with trade with the Caribbean. So, in fact, the first ship that Massachusetts sent out to the Caribbean to try to initiate this trade that became so lucrative actually contained Indian slaves that they were sending out that went to the colony of Providence Island. Indians were traded to the Caribbean. New England Indians ended up in Tangier rowing British naval galleys. They ended up being sold in the slave markets of Cadiz. In Spain, they ended up laboring in farms in plantations in the Azores Islands, in Jamaica, in Barbados, and in Bermuda and other locations. So these New England Indians were a commodity sold globally, maybe as far as the Indian Ocean. So what cargo would New England have had to introduce, you know, and start this trade with the Caribbean? Probably would have happened eventually, but timing is everything. So that's a counterfactual. I think they probably would have had to find a labor source the colonists would have wanted to, or their economy would have developed much more slowly, would have created much less wealth. If they weren't enslaving the Indians and indigenous people, I think the indigenous people would have held on to their numbers longer. Fewer people would have fled the region. Fewer people would have been killed or have died you know, from English disease and contact and living with the Indians. Families would have been less disrupted. So the indigenous population would have remained more powerful in that region longer. And then without the Indians serving as a charter generation, I think the law of slavery would have been different in New England. I think they would have adopted Virginia and Barbados style legal codes regarding slavery earlier. So I think, in other words, the heritability of slavery, black codes, slave codes, slaves as animals rather than as people for tax purposes, all of those things would have been part of the New England slave codes, would have been implemented much earlier so that the world that Africans encountered in New England would have been even harsher than the one that they did encounter. So, Margaret, what are you working on now? What aspect of history are you researching? Well, I've got two projects that are underway. One is a book called Escaping into the Cause of Freedom, the Epic Journey of William and Ellen Craft. So the Crafts were enslaved people in Georgia who escaped from slavery in very dramatic fashion. She dressed as a man and pretended to be the owner of her husband. They went to Boston. They were involved in anti-slavery speaking there, public speaking, and kind of mobilizing communities about slavery and about school integration and other causes. And Ellen was the first slave targeted under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. The crafts had to flee Boston. They went to England and lived in England for 15 years and did lots of really interesting things. Protested publicly at the 1851 Crystal Palace exhibition to try to draw the world's attention to slavery. Toured and spoke about slavery. William Craft went to Africa and tried to engage the province of Ouida and the king of Dahomey to stop the slave trade there. And then the Crafts returned to America after the Civil War, bought a plantation near the very area in which they had been enslaved, tried to provide a haven for former slaves, a cooperative farm and a school. So they spent over a decade educating hundreds of former slaves and trying to provide an economic alternative to working for their former masters for freedmen. The other project I'm working on is a kind of offshoot of Brethren by Nature. I got really interested in runaways and in who ran away, how they ran away, what freedom meant in colonial New England for Indians and Africans in 17th and 18th century, and who helped runaways, ranging from facilitating an escape and forging a pass to providing shelter to the lawyers and others and juries who supported these freedom suits in the 18th century. So I'm kind of interested in exploring the experience of running away in the colonial period. Again, we're so focused on the antebellum period and the period in which there's newspapers and runaway ads and so on. But the story is actually a lot more interesting and more complicated. So that story I'm probably going to take up into the antebellum period. Now, if we wanted to reach you with more questions about Native American slavery in early New England, how can we get in contact with you? 
you can email me and I'd love to hear from your listeners at newell.20 at osu.edu. Or you can visit my website at u.osu.edu backslash newell.20. And we could start a conversation there. Margaret Newell, thanks so much for joining us and for taking us through the history of Indian enslavement in New England. Oh, thank you, Liz. It was great to talk to you. And thanks for the great questions. Until recently, the history of slavery in the United States and North America has been portrayed as a Southern institution and a Southern problem. But as newer research like Margaret's demonstrates, slavery was also a Northern institution and a Northern problem. And we can see this in the fact that the very first place in English North America to develop a practice of slavery was New England. New Englanders turned to slavery when they faced an acute labor shortage. It took a lot of labor to clear farm fields of trees and rocks, to build homes and town buildings, and to raise a family and work a farm. This is why many New Englanders became concerned when the contracts of their indentured servants began to expire between 1635 and 1638. These servants saw what the land had to offer, and most opted not to renew their service contracts in favor of striking out on their own to become freeholders. So, what do you do when you need to build and operate a farm, a fishing or shipping business, or a mercantile warehouse, and there are no servants to be had? The first generation of New Englanders looked around them and decided that Indians held the answer. Native Americans far outnumbered the English colonists. Plus, Native Americans occupied land that the English colonists wanted. So, to solve their immediate labor crisis and to clear land of Native Americans, the New Englanders started a war. As Margaret noted, what became known as the Pequot War really took the Pequots by surprise. They had thought that they had a good relationship with the English. After all, they were shifting their trade from the Dutch to the English. But then their trade partners and neighbors waged war. The New Englanders waged what they called a just war, because a just war permitted the taking and enslavement of captives. By the end of the war, New Englanders had taken so many Pequot captives that they increased the available labor pool by 33%. Now, once enslaved, Native Americans labored on farms, in households, on fishing and trading ships. They made it possible for New England colonists to build and thrive in their new homes. By 1641, Indian slaves had become so valued that Massachusetts decided it was time to define and protect the status of their Pequot captives. The legal code the colony developed permitted the enslavement of people captured in a just war, of those who were sold to New Englanders by other people, or of people the civil government condemned to slavery. As Margaret mentioned, the law was ambiguous, which provided New Englanders a lot of room to innovate and evolve in their practice of slavery. Curiously, the law also left out mention of race, demonstrating that New Englanders had not conceived of slavery as a race-based condition. So it left the door open for African slavery and left open the question of whether slavery was a hereditary condition. So in the end, the ambiguity of the 1641 law left the enslaved and New Englanders to debate and negotiate their own peculiar institution well into the 19th century. So, if we best want to understand early America and how and why it informed the ideas, customs, laws, governance, and economies of the early United States, well, then we really need to grapple with the North's practices and participation in North American slavery. You'll find more information about Margaret, her book, Brethren by Nature, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 220. Don't forget, we're meeting up in Denver on Saturday, January 19 at 3.30 p.m. at Prost Brewing. I've posted all the details you need to attend this meetup and RSVP at benfranklinsworld.com slash meetup. Over the last 75 years, the Omohundro Institute has published over 200 books, and many of them are now classics in the field of early American history. You can check them out at benfranklinsworld.com slash oibooks. And when you find a title you wish to add to your library, use promo code 01 DAH40 to receive 40% off. This episode received valuable production assistance from Holly White. Thanks, Holly. Finally, Margaret mentioned that until recently, historians had given New England and the Northeast kind of a pass on slavery because of its sacrifice during the Civil War. What other areas of history do you think have gone understudied and have been given a pass? There are probably many aspects I haven't even thought of yet, so I'd love to know what you think. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.